looking at the idea of Christian communications. And of course, in everything we do, our primary example is Jesus Christ. I mentioned in an earlier lesson that there are many different ways we can learn about Jesus through Scripture. Essentially, the only way we learn about Jesus is through Scripture. We, we can't learn about Jesus just simply by going off on a mountaintop and meditating. But we learn about Jesus as he is revealed in the written word. But sometimes we, we look too narrowly and think only about the four gospel accounts as providing us with a picture of Jesus. But Jesus is the message of the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And in particular, whenever you look in the Old Testament, you find prophecies. God speaking, saying what the Messiah, what his son was going to be like. One of these that tells us something about communication is found in Isaiah 50, verse 4. And when you look at the context, it is the coming Messiah who is speaking. In prophecy, this is something that Jesus could say when he was here on earth. He says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens, he awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. Now, in his ministry, Jesus repeatedly emphasized that what he was saying had been given to him by the Father. He was giving us an example, showing us that we should rely on what God has said. The mouth the tongue of one who was taught, the ear of one who was taught. But notice how it's described. To have the ability to speak and to sustain with a word the person who is weary. A ministry of encouragement. And then to be able to hear, to hear with understanding. That's what in prophecy, Jesus is saying that he received from God, and certainly that's what we should pray for. A blessing to have the powerful gift of speaking and insightful listening. It's important for us because communication is at the root of fellowship. If there's no communication, there can't be any fellowship. Our fellowship with God is based upon his communication with us. Hebrews 1 opens, or excuse me, it's Hebrews, yes, excuse me. I got my notes garbled. Hebrews 1, the book of Hebrews opens, verses 1 and 2. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Notice God speaking. Now we think in terms of God speaking through the prophets. We think in terms of the written word. But it says also he has spoken to us through his son. In sending Jesus, he is speaking to us. God is the one who shows us the importance of communication and many of the problems we face in the Lord's church grow out of a lack of proper communication. Over the past few decades, there has been an erosion of biblical worship. And when we get to the root of what has caused that problem, it has been a shift away from doctrinal understanding and over to the idea of entertainment. 
What constitutes a good worship service? Well, in the denominational world, and unfortunately among some in the churches of Christ, it's a question of how much exuberance there is. They confuse being spirit-filled with being spirited. And you can be excited, and you can be in a frenzy, and you can have a very theatric performance and not be filled with the power of God. Whenever we think in terms of the music in the church, the primary function of music in the Lord's church is communication. Now, I love instrumental music. Whenever I am uh, at, in my home relaxing, I'll, I'll often play Baroque music. That happens to be my favorite, uh, listening to the harpsichord in the background. I, I love that. But listening to a musical instrument cannot ever convey doctrinal truth. Yes, sir. Yes. What is our music supposed to do? Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. We need to be very careful that we do not become so enraptured with the mechanics that we forget the content, the truth that needs to be in our singing. We can do that. The ones who bring in instrumental music do that. By definition, an instrument cannot teach. It cannot admonish. But we can do that even with vocal music. If our singing does not convey doctrinal truth, then it's nothing. It is mere show. We should pay careful attention to the songs we sing. <coughs> because there are songs that we sing that have little doctrinal meaning and some of them have flat out wrong meanings now i think we need to recognize poetic license and the reality that indeed um, something may speak to one person and not to another we must never be so locked into one style of music that we imagine that only songs that are a hundred years old are spiritual and we also have to be careful that we don't think that only current songs are spiritual. But an emphasis on entertainment rather than instruction is a problem. In the same way, whenever we look at the work of the church, if the work of the church becomes institutional rather than relational, it's a problem. Now, I'll tell you, the Bible uses a lot of analogies for the church. And the Bible uses business analogies, especially agribusiness, but other as well. <laughs> that the kingdom is like a merchant buying pearls. I mean, there, there are analogies that are used that are business analogies. I have no problem with that. But the primary analogy that we are given is relational. The church is is the family of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, whenever we think in terms of Christian communication, we need to realize that our communication in order to serve the Lord will develop over time. As I mentioned before, the things that are worthwhile take time. And indeed, over time, as you build relationships, you're able to communicate more effectively. When you know someone, you're able to communicate with him or her. I'd like for us to consider a few points for effective communication. The first of these is to be thoughtful. 
The scripture reading that was used, Proverbs 25, 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. A word fitly spoken. In order to be fitly spoken, it, to be appropriately spoken, there needs to be a goal. There needs to be an end in mind. Because if we just simply ramble without having something to say, we're prone to get into trouble. There's a catchphrase that I hear and I, I cringe when I do. Because people will say sometimes the most absurd or sometimes hurtful things, and then they'll end it with, I'm just saying. Well, you know what? I don't, I don't want to hear what you're just saying. Tell me something that has meaning. Ecclesiastes 10, beginning in verse 12. The words of a wise man's mouth win in favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of the mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what it is to be, and who can tell him what it will be after him? Whenever you think in terms of, of life, it is always good to take stock. When I was training in uh, the Red Cross first aid program, our instructor said, you know, in the world, people tell you, don't just stand there, do something. And then she said, I'm going to tell you something. Don't just do something, stand there. Because you're prone to hurt somebody if you don't think about what you're doing. Take a second thought. We need to make sure that our communication is situational. We cannot treat everyone in the same way. I have friends with whom I can communicate very briefly because they know. We have a back, backlog of, of communication. When I talk with someone that is a new acquaintance, Sometimes I must provide more context. We have to realize that speaking with someone outside of the Lord's church is very different from speaking with someone within the Lord's church. In the church, you can talk about being washed in the blood. You go out to somebody who has no background in Christianity and you say, are you washed in the blood? What are they going to think? It has to be situational. We have to have humility to count others more significant than ourselves, as we read in Philippians 2 and 3. And we have to remember each person, each person is an individual and needs to be treated as such. Colossians 4 verse 6 makes this point. Let your speech Always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person. I have a, a brother-in-law whose father uh, went through many, many heart difficulties. And so my brother-in-law has determined that he's going to do everything he can to avoid having heart difficulties. So he, he exercises and he has banned salt from their house. And I always dread when I go over to their home to eat. <laughs> because there's no salt. I've always thought about bringing my own shaker, but I haven't done that yet. But when something doesn't have salt, if you're accustomed to having salt on it, it just doesn't taste right. Paul says, let your speech be seasoned with salt. But notice... So that you may know how to, you ought to answer each person. You cannot have a stock answer, a glib answer to give different people. You need to take stock. Recognize where that person is. And then provide the answer. 
We need further to realize that effective Christian communication needs to be measured. Carpenters have a, a saying that you measure twice and cut once. In our communication, you should think twice and speak once. Because just like when you've taken a two by four and you've cut it and you find out you've mismeasured, you can't uncut it. And whenever you have spoken a word, now you can try to make it right, you can try to take it back, but you really can't unsay what you have said. You can always say something later, but you can't take back what you say. There's a poem, The Fool's Prayer, written over a hundred years ago. It's a poem about a king who in his vanity and, and irreverence looked over at his jester and said, Fool, Say a prayer for us. And the king obviously was expecting it to be a mockery. But instead, the, the jester bowed his knee down and offered a beautiful prayer. And the poem ends with the king leaving and saying, I'm the one who was the fool. But in this prayer, the jester asks this question. The ill-timed truth we might have kept, who knows how sharp it pierced and stung. The word we had not sense to say, who knows how grandly it had rung. Ecclesiastes 3, 7 tells us that there is a time to keep silence and a time to speak. Proverbs 10, 19, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. Jesus tells us in our worship to be very careful that we do not just simply fill time with words. Have you ever, I'm a preacher so I can talk about preachers. Have you ever heard a preacher who talked for a long time and he said a lot of words but he really didn't say anything? That if you left the service and someone said, what was the sermon about? All you could say was, well, it was about 25 minutes. Because that's what he did. He filled the time. Jesus tells us, Matthew 6, verse 7, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. We need to recognize that listening is an act of love. Communication is not just what you say, but it's how you hear. Have you ever talked with someone and they were talking at you but not with you and everything you said, you could see they were working on what were they going to say. Listening is an act of love. And that is how God listens to us. Psalm 119, verse 149. The psalmist prays to God and says this. Hear my voice according to your steadfast love, O Lord, according to your justice, give me life. Hear my voice. How? According to your steadfast love. Now, God listens to us and has spoken to us. There's communication. But we need to realize that if we stop listening to God, God will stop listening to us. Now, does God still know everything? Of course he knows everything we say. 
But if we break the communication with God, then we should not expect God to receive with favor what we say to him. The prophet Zechariah speaks for God in chapter 7, beginning in verse 8. And the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. And let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. But they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears that they might not hear. They made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words of the Lord of hosts that the Lord of hosts had sent them by his spirit through the former prophets. Now notice the picture here. God sent a word to his people, and it says they covered their ears. They made their hearts as hard as a diamond so that the word couldn't come in. The text goes on. Therefore great anger came from the Lord of hosts. As I called, and they would not hear, so they called. And I would not hear, said the Lord of hosts. Now, God is the one who initiates the communication. We didn't, in our wisdom, come up with some plan and then we stormed the heavens and persuaded God to save us. No, it's completely the opposite. We were lost and had no idea of where to go, and God in his great mercy spoke through his written word and through his son, the incarnate word. But when God reaches out to us, we must accept his word of grace. And if we do not, we will stand condemned. It has to be not only a matter of receiving from God, but also a matter of receiving it with the open heart. Hebrews 2 verse 1, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. Now, we listen to God because we love him and he has displayed his love towards us. We should let our communication with one another also be directed by love. It was Theodore Roosevelt who said, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Effective communication depends on seeing the value of each person. And we need to see that communication is also an act of humility. None of us know everything. Over the years, I've read several articles about intelligence and successful leadership. Whenever you look at the men who are at the very top of the major corporations in the United States, you know, you would expect them to be men of extraordinary intelligence. But the interesting thing is, normally they are men of just slightly more than average intelligence. And the reason is this. Whenever somebody is accustomed to being the smartest man or woman in the room, that person won't listen to anyone else. And no matter how smart you are, you don't know everything, and you will make mistakes. Proverbs 15, 22 tells us, Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. To be effective, to abound in the work of the Lord, we need to cultivate the humility to recognize 
that we don't know everything and that our brothers and sisters in Christ very well might be able to help us. Again from Proverbs, Proverbs 19.20, Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. As we look at all of these truths, we see the importance of receiving God's word in love, of placing ourselves before him in prayer. We see the importance of communicating with love and respect and humility with one another. We need to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We need to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We need, in compassion and love, to communicate with one another. Effective Christians abounding in the work of the Lord recognize the importance of both speaking and listening. To do this, we build relationships. But in all, we must keep God central. He is the one who has spoken. We must not reject the one who is speaking from heaven. And as we attempt to communicate, we must make sure that the gospel, the good word concerning Jesus, is always at the center. We should be looking at ways to bring one another closer to Christ. And anything that we say that gives encouragement to someone in the Lord's service is a good word. But we also must make sure that we help those who are outside of Christ to come to know the Savior. You see, people do not <coughs> receive a direct revelation as Saul did on the road to Damascus. There is only one way that someone is going to learn the truth, and that is if it is received. If this word is given to them, it can be by handing a tract, it can be through a sermon, it can be through a radio broadcast, however it might be. But the word of God is what has the power to save. And it is that word that we want to commend to anyone here who is not yet a Christian. We have one question to ask to you. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Because if you believe, and if you're willing to make a statement of that faith, you can be baptized into Christ. You can have your sins forgiven. You can receive eternal life. This morning... If you are not a Christian, if you understand God's way of salvation, do not reject the one who is speaking to you, but accept his word of love. Won't you come as together we stand and sing?